Thank you for joining me. Inflammation, the fires within. Inflammation was central to medical research at the turn of last century. With little delay, inflammation became a household word in the 2000s. Chronic inflammation is broadly recognized now as the root of most, if not all, degenerative disease. Here we explore inflammation according to the wealth of clinical research by Dr. Emmanuel Ravici. I had the good fortune of being with Dr. Ravici in his clinic in Manhattan in the 1980s, and as well consulting with him by phone when I was back in my practice, then in Oregon. Inflammation made headlines in the news in the early 2000s. In a Washington Post article, the body's first and most primitive defense may play a crucial role in some of the most devastating afflictions of modern humans. And then further in 2004 in Time Magazine cover makes the same connection. Inflammation is the body's first defense against infection, trauma, and a foreign body. But when it goes awry, it can lead to a host of chronic illness. Dr. Ravici, born in 1897 in Romania, came of age as a scientist, a physician, when the Nobel Prize was awarded for quantum mechanics. I have vacillated over the years whether Dr. Ravici adds quantum physics or quantum chemistry to medicine. No mind, both or either way moves medicine refreshingly beyond mostly two, mm, well, occasionally three, dimensional biochemistry. Ravici adds new dimensions to our understanding of the body's defense, what he called the biphasic lipid defense. What is the most primitive and first defense that unchecked can lead to a lifetime of debilitating ailments? This presentation is about how lipids, how fatty acids and cholesterol play a critical role in our body's defense. It is also about how the lipid defense cannot solve the effects of our toxic environment and lifestyle. Nevertheless, there are therapeutic lipids to support the lipid defense, bring relief, and sometimes solve impasses. The first and most primitive defense is fatty acids. We pay slight attention to inflammatory fatty acids, much more to their downstream effects, usually only to the downstream effects, even beyond those of the most inflammatory fatty acids, leukotrienes. Toxins trigger, activate phospholipase enzymes enzymes that lyse arachidonic acid from membrane phospholipids. Arachidonic acid is then metabolized by two enzymes, cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase, to prostaglandins and leukotrienes respectively. Prostaglandins and leukotrienes are the fatty acids that throw sparks, lighting the fire. Here, the fire manifests as symptoms from toxic exposures. Toxins ignite inflammation. This is certainly not an exhaustive list of toxins, not even exhaustive of categories of toxins. I have not succeeded in ordering these toxins from the most damaging to the least. Impossible. I have put stress at the top. Next, I've put three main dietary transgressions 
that began in the 1930s. That's when margarine started to replace butter. And actually, I put a fourth ages there too, because that began at the same time. Beyond that, we have everything else that has been escalating over the last decades since World War II. Xenobiotics, chemicals foreign to living organisms, rapidly developed during the World War, were thereafter applied to civilian life, escalating exponentially ever since. Phospholipases are found in every cell, every cell with a nucleus and nuclear membrane. That includes all cells in our body, except symbiotic bacteria. And phospholipases are very diverse. Advances in research are astounding, certainly in the almost 50 years since I graduated from medical school, and more so in the more than 60 years since Dr. Ravici published his monograph. Lipidomics and transgenic knockout mice reveal the roles of phospholipids. Lipidomics is the study of cellular lipids in biological systems. Fortunately, brought to the fore by Dr. Navio. Transgenic is the introduction of one or more DNA sequences from another species. And knockout is replacing an existing gene with an artificial piece of DNA. Lipidomics on transgenic knockout mice models demonstrate their involvement in diverse biologic events. Secretory PLA2 is the largest family within the PLA2 superfamily. Secretory PLA2 itself has 11 isoforms, each with unique distributions and specific enzymatic properties. We will discuss the case of a man with a high PLA2 whose ketogenic diet does not reduce his phenomenal abdominal girth or even reduce although not so phenomenal, his weight, nor his high coronary calcifications. Membranes are the brains of cells. As phospholipids are removed from the membrane, the function of membranes and therefore cells deteriorate. Leukotrienes turn membranes into a reservoir of fatty acids for perpetuating the self-propagating peroxides that leukotrienes themselves create. Phospholipases do damage by their metabolism of membrane phospholipids to inflammatory fatty acids and by their damage to membranes. Bilayer cell membranes, an outer Polar layer, primarily of phospholipids, dissolves in water. The outer and inner polar layers sandwich the hydrophobic inner layer. The bilayer allows separation of aqueous compartments, intra versus extracellular, with opposing electrolyte ion concentrations. The inner bilayer carries a negative charge the outer a positive charge. Each cell is a battery. The composite of all cell batteries is our body battery. Remove phospholipids and batteries fade. Eventually, so do many cells and eventually, ultimately, the organism. The three vertical columns here are the glycerol backbone of phospholipids. Phosphatidylcholine is a major component of lecithin, a yellow-brown fatty substance found in egg yolk, organ meats, nuts, and spinach. Phosphatidylcholine is the target of PLA2, activated by toxins. 
highlighted above. Phosphatidylcholine is the most abundant phospholipid in mammalian cell membranes, and its peroxidation is pivotal to the development of many degenerative diseases we see every day. Fatty acids that are the body's first defense create wanted, necessary inflammation. However, when fatty acids persist in excess, there's trouble. First, please appreciate only free fatty acids are subject to phospholipases. Otherwise, they are inert, bound in esters with cholesterol, building adipose tissue itself, a serious source of inflammation. The left-hand chart here lists sources of free fatty acids. Note the role cortisol plays in increasing free fatty acids. Note also PUFAs, dietary omega-6 and omega-3 supplements are sources of free fatty acids. PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And we've included CDR, the cell danger response as defined by Navio here. Navio describes the conservation of oxidative phosphorylation in the CDR, especially CDR1 and 2 and CDR3 when there's not resolution healing. Oxidative phosphorylation is the place free fatty acids are turned into energy, ATP. But when this is conserved, the free fatty acids will build up as part of the body's defense. In summary, too many free fatty acids is too much inflammation, is too much chronic inflammation, is chronic degenerative disease. Here is a review of the metabolism of omega-6, linoleic acid. Prostaglandin E2 series is one of the two inflammatory fatty acids made from arachidonic acid. Insulin, carbs, stimulate delta-5 desaturase, which explains why high-carbohydrate diets are inflammatory. And fish oil inhibits delta-5 desaturase, which explains our enormous consumption of fish oil, even though it is a source of free fatty acids. PGE2 is the other hand of PGE1. You can't have one without the other. Do not go after Delta-5 desaturase with EPA supplements. Large pharmaceutical doses, acutely, yes. Chronically, no. PLA2 is a big player in Alzheimer's. Here we see a study of genetically engineered mice where reducing PLA2 prevents memory deficits. PLA2 is also a player in COVID. It is associated with COVID mortality. It is called a shredder enzyme because it shreds mitochondria that look like bacteria mitochondria that are released from cells when cells are damaged. As mentioned, secreted PLA2 is the largest family with many isoforms within the superfamily of PLA. Secreted PLA2 is a known big player in obesity, NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver, diabetes, insulin resistance, and adipose tissue inflammation. 
these are the very conditions most susceptible to COVID demise. Free fatty acids are often referred to as NIFAs, non-esterified fatty acids. As mentioned, free fatty acids are the only biologically active fatty acids. Fatty acids are not free when in esters with cholesterol in lipoproteins, LDL, VLD, L, HDL, and they are not free active bound to albumin. When albumin is low, more free NIFAs are metabolized to inflammatory fatty acids and more free fatty acids convert more fibrinogen to thrombi and decrease ionized magnesium. We are about to learn eating more cholesterol is a crucial and strategic defense against NIFAs, free fatty acids that are running amok in inflammation. Here is Dr. Ravici's definition of lipids. While lipids have polar groups, energetically, the non-polar portion is predominant. The non-polar group of fatty acids is dynamic. Three common fatty acids have varying charges on the carbon chains. Actually, a charged carbon between double bonds defines an essential fatty acid. Linoleic has one such carbon, linolenic has two, and not surprisingly, arachidonic has three such carbons. Arachidonic is the most active essential fatty acid. The activity of a hydroxyl OH polar group here at C3 on the cyclopentanophenanthrene ring of cholesterol, wow, I said that right, is determined by the nonpolar portion, specifically by the placement of double bonds within the first two aromatic rings. Cholesterol's metabolites have varying ring structures and polar groups. Progesterone has a ketone at C3, while vitamin D3 still has the hydroxyl group at C3, the same as cholesterol, but the second ring is open. Lipids are fields of energy. This image of cholesterol is the signature of our drravici.com website. Here is the punchline. Here's how it works. Steric coupling. The active flexible free fatty acid molecule is neutralized, disarmed when coupled with the stable cholesterol molecule. So yes, cholesterol controls wanted inflammation. However, as we have seen, its attempt to control chronic inflammation is ill-fated. Moreover, that attempt to control chronic inflammation comes at a very steep price. Please note the tissue cholesterol at the bottom of this image. The biphasic lipid defense. Fatty acids are the first and most primitive defense. Fatty acids are sparks that light inflammatory fires within. Cholesterol is their control rod. We need a control rod, not an off on switch. Inflammatory fatty acids are essential for normal metabolism. Let's look into tissue cholesterol. First, let's review cholesterol in the blood. It's in lipoprotein carriers. 
The total cholesterol is the total of all the cholesterol in all the carriers, LDL cholesterol in the LDL carrier and HDL cholesterol in the HDL carrier. So this is the lipoprotein carrier. The point is that cholesterol is bound. It is not active. It is bound in esters with fatty acids. And the fatty acids aren't uh, active either. They're bound as well. Tissue cholesterol is the anti-inflammatory. Free cholesterol in tissues bind arachidonic acid before it is metabolized into inflammatory fatty acids. LDL cholesterol delivers, HDL removes. This diagram highlights the delivery and removal. Small LDL particles in the wide bottom yellow arc deposits cholesterol in the intima. The HDL in the green actually removes cholesterol from the intima, and both are returned to the liver. Here is the calculation of tissue cholesterol, both in US conventional and international SI units. We multiply the total cholesterol by the LDL over the HDL, the rate of delivery versus the rate of removal. The working ranges for tissue cholesterol are three to 500 milligrams per deciliter or 7.7 .7 to 12.9 millimoles per liter. To get these calculations, we use the mid-range of each of the three numbers used in the calculation. In the US, the mid-range for LDL is 115, HDL is 55, total cholesterol is 190. In SI units, 2.97 for LDL mid-range, 1.42 for HDL and 4.91 for total cholesterol. Now, there's nothing special about the numbers we use here. This is an approximation to give us a feel. And that's the emphasis, please. I could say a lot about the mid ranges. Actually, I think they're extraordinarily conservative. I've struck a balance between what the modern medical requirements are for cholesterol, which are lower and lower and lower every day, <laughs> at least every few years, versus the, versus the research that has shown, which I can't pull up right now, that the ideal cholesterol, total cholesterol, is 240. I'll get that for you someday, for sure. It's often true that the tissue cholesterol follows the LDL. If the LDL is low, tissue cholesterol is low and vice versa, but not always. If all three, LDL, HDL, and total, are low or high, you don't get a low or high tissue cholesterol. And that's important as we move on to the therapeutics. Now as a reminder, neither LDL nor HDL are good or bad. People have heart attacks with low LDL. Low LDL still serves as a scarred to damaged intima tissue. And it's very possible the statin effect is 
most prevalent from the anti-inflammatory effect of statins. And of course, HDL is not just good. You remove too much cholesterol and arachidonic runs amok. Total cholesterol also follows tissue cholesterol, as does LDL. Editorials in two major medical publications in the US in 1989 and 1990 warned of the dangers of cholesterol below 160, below 4.14. Here's more. Low cholesterol level is a robust predictor of mortality in the non-demented elderly. And men with low fat intakes have a higher mortality than men with higher fat intakes. Lastly, in confirmation of our tissue cholesterol calculation, HDL cholesterol has an indirect relationship with bone density. So the more removal of cholesterol, the lesser the bone density. Eating cholesterol actually is an excellent strategy if your hormones are low. This was published last century, the fourth edition just in 2002. This is a landmark textbook in endocrinology. In summary, 80% of the cholesterol used for steroid hormone synthesis derives from dietary cholesterol, not from what the adrenals synthesize and not from the stored cholesterol in the lipoprotein esters. I can tell you from firsthand experience, eating cholesterol does not raise your blood cholesterol at all. But we're not treating the cholesterol blood value. And a fun finding in the Nurses Health Study at the Harvard School of Public Health back in 2007, those who ate low fat dairy products had difficulty receiving conceiving, conceiving, because of lack of ovulation. Women who ate at least one full fat dairy product a day were 27% less likely to have this problem. Dr. Avicii spoke and wrote of dualism, starting with the dualism of electrostatic versus quantum forces. The centripetal versus the centrifugal forces of atoms. Lipids fall into two categories, acid and bases, fatty acids and anti-fatty acids, with acid and alkaline polar groups respectively. Then we see which of the lipids fit in each category saturated fatty acids, omegas, arachidonic, prostaglandin E2, and leukotrienes, fatty acids, cholesterol, glycerol, triglycerides, cortisol, anti-fatty acids. Glycerol can attach to one, two, or three fatty acids. As a triglyceride, it's three. As a diglyceride, it's two, or a I guess, uniglyceride? I'm not sure. <laughs> Let's go on. Okay, fatty acids are called catabolic because they break down. They break down the toxin, the allergy, the unwanted cell, the damaged tissue. And anabolic because they build up, not only because they break down or they, they neutralize the fatty acids, but because they prevail in childhood, in pregnancy, pregnancy, estrogen, progesterone, two very strongly anabolic hormones enables pr pregnancy. Lipid bound sulfur and MGS are catabolic agents used 
to offset imbalances from the anti-fatty acids, the anabolic lipids. It's not quite that one for one, but we'll tease that out when we get to cases shortly. Flanquil Plus, on the other hand, is a fatty alcohol, and that use is used against the fatty acid group. Let's turn to the last slide in this section to see the choices that promote catabolism versus anabolism. These choices include dietary, supplements, and I really like to point out that salt is anabolic. It's an excellent way to increase anabolism, especially in those who are dutifully following a low salt diet that the doctors insist on. Moderate caffeine and alcohol are fine, but catabolic in excess. Sun exposure, a severe sunburn, very catabolic. Fatty alcohols, perfect. Too much exercise or no exercise is catabolic. The right amount is anabolic. Of course, stress is catabolic versus rest and out-breath versus in-breath. What are tissues? Cells are the blue circles in the left of this diagram. Tissues are aggregates of like cells and are boundaried by lymphatics. We are measuring the interstitial pH when we measure urine pH. As Ravici called them, interstitial formations provide the fluid and structural environment for cells. Lipids provide the structure for the body's soft tissues. A paper was published in 2018 reporting the discovery of a heretofore unrecognized tissue that some proposed could be an organ. Researchers called the interstitial space the interstitium and anticipate finding novel treatment for inflammation, fibrosis, sclerosis, and metastases by studying its structure and constituents. Ravici already demonstrated its constituents now almost 100 years ago through his novel urine and blood tests. There are four tissues in the body, endothelia, nerve, muscle, and connective tissue. Organs are composites of different tissues and the organism the composite of the organ. What is the significance of hierarchical organization? Each entity is bound by a membrane, tissues by lymphatic endothelia, organs by blood vessel endothelia, and the organism by skin. A disruption of the fatty acid to anti-fatty acids ratio affects every membrane, the entire organism at every level. And we must include membranes within cells, nuclear, of the endoplasmic reticulum and other organelles, the inner and outer mitochondrial membranes. The specifics of this disruption are mapped now with metabolomics. Major disruptions in phosphatidylcholine, for example, appears to be a signature of chronic fatigue syndrome and myalgic encephalomyelitis. Membrane permeability is determined in large part by fatty acid to anti-fatty acid ratio. The nonpolar portion of fatty acids is perpendicular to membranes, while the nonpolar portion of sterols is parallel to the membranes. Membrane charge and composition are inseparable, and both are inseparable from cell function.
Fatty acids increase permeability, sterols decrease permeability. Cholesterol in cell membranes decreases the permeability of the cell, including the permeability of oxygen. Here is a healthy diurnal urine pH. Alkaline in the early morning and by evening acid. Back to alkaline the next morning. Free cholesterol is highest at 4 to 6 a.m. The hydroxypolar group yields a urine pH greater than 6.2. Free fatty acids peak at 8 to 9 p.m. Carboxyl polar groups yield a urine pH less than 6.2. Use pH paper with less than 0.5 increments. Whole and half numbers are not useful. In the morning, test the second morning urine unless the person voided in less than three hours before rising. We want the pH at that time of day. We don't want the pH of the average of many hours of sleep and test the urine before caffeine. It alkalizes the urine. The evening sample should be more than an hour after eating. We lose the diurnal pH pattern in the urine when there's pain. We also lose it when there's other symptoms and certainly when there is a chronic disease. The top graph shows the urine becomes more alkaline as the pain intensifies. Alkaline pain. The bottom, acid pain, the pain becomes more intense the more acid the urine. To quote Ravici, pain arises from changes in the pH of the intercellular fluid that bathes sensorial nerve endings. Intercellular referring here, of course, to the interstitial formations. The same dualism that Rivici plotted out for pain, he does also with vertigo, puritis, itching, hearing impairment, dyspnea, shortness of breath, and manic depressive conditions. And we can include nausea here, including the nausea in early pregnancy. If the urine is acid, we can use sodium bicarb to alleviate pain or symptoms. If the urine is alkaline, we can use lemon juice Let's return to our chart on dualism and lipids and fill in more characteristics of catabolic and anabolic. Homogenization versus differentiation is important when we're looking at slides of cancer cells. There'll be much more differentiation in an anabolic cancer. Desoxybiosis versus anoxybiosis refers to the functions of these lipids. In essence, catabolic lipids hijack oxygen from respiration and turn that oxygen into reactive oxygen species. On the other hand, anabolic lipids decrease oxygenation. We saw this with the cholesterol in the cell membranes, and we'll see more as we proceed down this list. I choose the word chaotic under catabolic based on the work of Nancy Banks, who has turned molecular biology into quantum physics. She speaks of the eukaryotic edge of chaos eukaryotic. 
the nucleated cell. And the opposite of that extreme is rigidity. Similarly, we have inflammation and sclerosis. Sclerosis, hardening, as in atherosclerosis. I always think too of rheumatoid arthritis as inflammatory and osteoarthritis as a anabolic arthritis. You get hardening, increase in bone, the joints. However, these categories are not mutually exclusive because clearly there's inflammation in osteoarthritis. Then on a positive side, the creative potential and the creative manifestation for anabolic. The inspiration and its fulfillment. I'm reminded of a quote from Nietzsche that I've had around for a few decades. <laughs> One must still have chaos in oneself to be able to give birth to a dancing star. We've spoken of the pH already, more acid for the fatty acids, more alkaline for the anti-fatty acids. Likewise, specific gravity, ORP, and actually surface tension to all of the urine can be used to determine the off balances. Each category has pathogenic lipids. On the catabolic side, the pathogenic lipid is the leukotrienes. We need some leukotrienes, they work for us, but it's the excess and the uncontrolled that create damage, tissue damage. And the pathogenic actually have the opposite effect on the pH than the other fatty acids. And the same holds true for the pathogenic anabolic lipids. Some tissue cholesterol is a good thing. Some cortisol is absolutely necessary, but high amounts lead to irreversible tissue damage. And these pathogenic lipids acidify as opposed to the other anti-fatty acids. We've spoken of the prostaglandin, prostaglandin E2 series from arachidonic acid. And now let's jump into the leukotrienes. Again, irreversible damage to tissues. They bind chloride and therefore alkalinize tissues. And once the tissues are alkalinized, that decreases the mineral solubility and availability. Actually, minerals, for example, calcium, are lost to deposits in the tissues. Dr. Uravici discovered leukotrienes in the 1930s. He called them conjugated trienic fatty acids. The reason for that name being we have three double bonds that are parallel to each other, hence the trienic and hence the conjugated. This is an extremely reactive lipid. The structure of leukotrienes wasn't actually known until about 40 years later, 40 years after Avicii's discovery. And a Nobel Prize was given for the structure of the icosanoids that leukotrienes are a member of in the 1980s. It is the conjugated trienic bonds that enable leukotrienes to buy, bind chloride. And the chloride is bound in two steps. Actually, one of the double bonds is moved, and this is what makes this process irreversible. As tissue cholesterol is the anti-fatty acid for prostaglandin E2s, 
Cortisol is the anti-fatty acid for leukotrienes. Cortisol and leukotrienes are both pathogenic. The pathogenicity of cortisol summarizes degenerative diseases, diseases of civilization, and also those conditions most susceptible to COVID demise, obesity, metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, dyslipidemia, insulin resistance. A prospective study at a hospital in Turkey found that cortisol levels predicted mortality due to the coronavirus disease in 2019. It is not surprising now that the same conditions describing the pathogenicity of cortisol are also marked by high phospholipase A2. It is also not surprising that this population is particularly susceptible to viral infections. Viruses thrive on sterols. Viral illness, for example, influenza, can be more prominent and virulent in summer. Summer, heat, anabolism. Hydrocortisone is manufactured cortisol, a pill a prescription medication. This reference is telling us leukotriene B4 reverses the benefits of hydrocortisone. Inhibition of T cell proliferation and interleukin-2 production by hydrocortisone is reversed by leukotriene B4. Are there medications that thwart leukotrienes other than steroids? The only one I'm aware of is called Singulair, among other names in the US, for asthma. But inhaled steroids are usually preferred for their effectiveness. Exercise-induced asthma is probably the best application and maybe only application of Singulair. If we know the pathology at play, we know what therapeutic lipids to choose. Sites of physiopathology have free unbound lipids. Only free unbound lipids are active lipids. Dr. Ravici used physiopathology, not pathophysiology as we are familiar today. His choice here as well with the likes of interstitial formations always makes me smile. Fond memories, his accent, and a reminder of his reminder that he spoke five and a half languages, the half being English. Not to mention a vast difference in medical language 70 years ago when Dr. Avici compiled his monograph. This understanding of pathology is gaining momentum among many disciplines. Chronic illness is caused by biological reactions to an injury and not the injury or agent of injury. When anti-fatty acids are lacking, inflammatory fatty acids and leukotrienes run amok. Fatty acids and leukotrienes are reactions to injury. And as we're about to see, inflammatory fatty acids, leukotrienes, tissue cholesterol, and cortisol can all run amok. Dr. Ravici initiated dozens of therapeutic lipids or therapeutic agents as he chose to call them. Here are the most commonly used of the therapeutic lipids available at Health Equations. Two things to note here. Each agent works at a specified level. Heavier elements and longer chain alcohols are active in the smaller original entities within hierarchical organization. On the catabolic side, selenium is heavier than sulfur and magnesium. 
sulfur and magnesium work at the tissue levels, selenium at the cell level. On the anabolic side, the longest chain fatty alcohol, flame quell 8, works in the nucleus. Secondly, progesterone is a lipid. We will not cover hormones in this introductory presentation. It is, a list, it is listed so you can stay aware that exogenous hormones are active lipids that have a significant effect on the lipid defense. Flame Quell Plus is excellent for upper respiratory symptoms. Start it at the onset of a cold and both severity and duration will usually dramatically decrease. Start it at the first sign of sniffles in children. A starting dose is two droppers Flame Quell Plus three to four times a day. The droppers can go in a bit of water, four tablespoons or 30 to 60 milliliters chased by more water or a dropper will fit in the large end of a double lot gelatin capsule. These capsules, however, cannot be pre-made since fatty alcohols dissolve them. Make the capsules when you are ready to ingest it. For children who do not swallow capsules, add as much glycerol to the water as needed to disguise the taste of the alcohols. Or since glycerol alone is an anti-inflammatory, give a small spoon of it as needed. Children love it. Glycerol is a fat that tastes quite sweet. Flame Quell Plus can be repeated as often as needed. It has no toxicity, none, none whatsoever. Dr. Avici gave a liter of this intravenously without any negative consequence. In acute situations for trauma or migraines as examples, as long as there is some indication it helps, even minor improvements after two doses 20 minutes apart, continue to repeat it every 20 minutes until there is wanted relief. Lipid-bound sulfur is for more serious respiratory symptoms. The usual dose here is one dropper approximately every 12 hours. Start with two droppers if symptoms are severe and take as often as every six hours if needed. The droppers of lipid-bound sulfur can be put directly in the mouth, then swallowed, or on bites of food, or in the large end of a double lot gelatin capsule. As we go down these lists, four conditions could require both Flame Quell Plus and lipid-bound sulfur, COVID, migraines, osteoarthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis. When both kinds of inflammatory fatty acids play a role, use Flame Quell Plus to relieve symptoms. I consider lipid-bound sulfur a must for rheumatoid arthritis and all autoimmune disease, since leukotrienes are responsible for irreversible damage and autoimmunity. Regular use of Flame Quell Plus for rheumatoid and osteoarthritis is indicated when it relieves and or prevents symptoms. Regular use of lipid-bound sulfur is also indicated for osteoarthritis to prevent progression. Daily use of Flame Quell Plus has kept my sister's osteoarthritis at bay. She was able to garden again. Her urine pH is almost always acid, so I gave fatty alcohols Flame Quell Plus to neutralize inflammatory fatty acids. Continuing in the lipid-bound sulfur column, a colleague took lipid-bound sulfur for sudden severe pain in his eye one evening. This was the same pain he had from herpes many years earlier. He took three doses of lipid-bound sulfur, two that evening, and a third the next morning, just in case. All symptoms were resolved before he went to bed. A 70-year-old woman had responded well to lipid-bound sulfur previously for a sore throat, generalized achiness, and fatigue. 
She took lipid-bound sulfur again in 2020, a seeming reasonable trial for her central serous retinopathy that began after a course of steroid therapy for a sinus infection years earlier. The relapse threatened her vision in one eye and was not stabilizing with the only available medical treatment, intraorbital injections every six weeks. Fortunately, a retinal scan after a few months on lipid-bound sulfur showed 100% remission. A chiropractor's choice of lipids is not only determined by his study of Ravici, but as well by palpation of visceral reflex points, iridology, tongue diagnosis, and the experience 40 years of practice affords. He gave lipid-bound sulfur to a 54-year-old carpenter for his abdominal pain, fatigue, loss of appetite, and inability to eat a normal size meal. He did successful spinal adjustments for his patient's low back pain and headaches. Within two days on lipid-bound sulfur, the abdominal pain was gone. His appetite returned to normal and an increase in energy enabled him to return to work. However, extremely severe abdominal pain two months later required surgery. 60% of the removed abdominal sarcoma was dead. This carpenter had been diagnosed at Mayo Clinic with inoperable abdominal sarcomas and had declined the offered palliative chemotherapy. Yes, Ravici is known for successfully treating end-stage cancers. Two emphasis here. With rare exception, we have not been able to repeat Ravici's astounding results yet. And we do not treat cancer with therapeutic lipids. We write, we correct or reinforce the lipid defense as needed with therapeutic lipids. Ask which lipid will offset the lipidic off-balance in the lipid defense. I look forward to future PowerPoints in this regard. Although there are many published papers about sulfur in human metabolism, there are no publications regarding how this lipid-bound sulfur works. Our searches, nevertheless, are leading us to trial its neuropsychiatric benefits with very encouraging results. Although there are no studies in the peer review literature either regarding short chain fatty alcohol clinical use in humans, animal studies show butanol, one of the alcohols in Flamequil Plus, inhibits phospholipase D. This particular phospholipase D hydrolyzes membrane phosphatidylcholine to phosphatidic acid and choline. Phosphatidic acid primes purinergic signaling early in CDR. This raises many possibilities. Flamequel Plus as a preventative, a regulator of CDR, dose, frequency, how to adjust, etc. To which I add a study on synovial organ cultures found butanol decreases expression of pro-inflammatory genes in rheumatoid arthritic fibroblasts. As more clinicians use these therapeutic lipids, Collecting data is a foreseeable target and goal. Flamewell Plus can alleviate some of the symptoms and injury of trauma. Of note, butanol was included in the first aid kits of Mercedes-Benz vehicles for many years last century. Why? It stops hemorrhage. Flamequel Plus decreased uterine hemorrhaging in a woman with metastatic ovarian cancer. 
FlameQuell Plus will decrease the severity and duration of the pain if started at the first signs of a migraine. Well, FlameQuell Plus predictably helped a woman suffering from migraines. She sometimes also needs lipid-bound sulfur to recover from the postrome. FlameQuell Plus reduces the severity of symptoms from a sunburn, relieves severe vertigo in a 75-year-old woman experienced after cataract surgeries, and alleviates the itching from the likes of poison ivy, measles, and chickenpox. But first, coax the child into a bath with a sock full of cooked oatmeal. The combination is terrific. Finishing the right-hand column, when a 38-year-old woman, having previously lived in a WDB, water-damaged building, was exposed again to mold, her symptoms resumed with a vengeance. Lipid-bound sulfur saved the day until she was able to move again. Last on the list, Dr. Ravici used lipid-bound sulfur to rein in the withdrawal symptoms from alcohol and nicotine. A flood of catabolic leukotrienes that offset the anabolic ethanol and nicotine agents remain while the anabolic addictive substance is withdrawn. The symptoms of withdrawal all result from the overwhelming systemic alkalosis of leukotrienes. Lipid-bound sulfur oxidizes leukotrienes. Let's talk about leukotrienes and COVID. A 17-year-old in rural U.S. lived alternatively at her father's and mother's just 15 minutes apart. Both homes were quarantined. There was no known exposure at school. The first thing she noticed was tightness in her chest and shortness of breath. Then she developed a fever and extreme lethargy. Four days later, she received a dropper of lipid-bound sulfur and two droppers of FlameQuell Plus in water when she arrived at her mother's that evening. Lipid-bound sulfur and FlameQuell Plus were again repeated in the morning and FlameQuell Plus at noon the next day. That afternoon, she developed a severe, uncontrollable coughing spasm. Her mother gave her a fourth of a teaspoon glycerol and two droppers FlameQuell Plus in water three times, each 20 minutes apart. Her cough stopped completely. That evening, she was back on the phone and social media. The next morning, her mother said, it's as if it never happened. I jumped on COVID with lipid-bound sulfur two years ago, March 2020, when I learned of lethal cytokine storms. Leukotrienes release cytokines. You cannot have a cytokine storm without a leukotriene tornado. Lipid-bound sulfur oxidizes leukotrienes. There is only one case of COVID that did not have an immediate and striking response to lipid-bound sulfur and FlameQuell Plus. The prescribed cholesterol-lowering drugs for a 75-year-old man with cardiac risk markedly decreased his cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. They decreased so much that he barely had a trace, literally, of tissue cell cholesterol. His TCH was 11 in U.S. units. The low end of the TCH range in U.S. units is 300. The good news is he managed to avoid the hospital and having stopped the cholesterol-lowering drugs, he recovered quickly. What are lipid-bound minerals? They are minerals incorporated within fatty acid molecules. 
They are transported by red blood cells, according to Dr. Ravici, and are delivered to pathological tissues and cells. The wonders are, they go where they are needed, they do not accumulate, and they are non-toxic. These are all studies of MGS, magnesium thiosulfate, on rats, and certainly enough data to warrant full-scale human clinical trials. But thiosulfate cannot be patented. It's been around too long and therefore of little interest to pharmaceutical companies. It lowers blood pressure and glomerular filtration rates while attenuating renal damage and recurrent kidney stones. All of our hypertensive patients get two droppers MGS in water twice daily. And we are finding droppers held in the mouth for two minutes before swallowing will reduce an acute elevation in blood pressure. Looking at some cases. First, a 60-year-old man with very high cardiovascular risk. His father and two brothers died young of heart disease. He is a sitting duck, as we say in English. That is, the same could happen to him at any moment. Cardiovascular disease is an anabolic imbalance. His anabolic activity is over 100. Scores between minus 50 and plus 50 are within the wanted range. I use scores, the deviation from the middle of the wanted range, in an original algorithm that assesses various aspects of our physiology, including catabolic and anabolic indices. These indices are derived from a CBC and chemistry and lipid panels. We have done more than 30,000 evaluations over the past 30 years. In this man, lactic acid produced by the high tissue cholesterol displaced chloride, causing a low serum chloride. Hence, that effect is included in the anabolic score. This is a typical pattern in both cardiovascular and diabetes risk a high tissue cholesterol, a high triglyceride with a low HDL. High insulin raises triglycerides and lowers HDL. This is the pattern that responds best to a ketogenic diet. This man has regularly donated blood. His somewhat rare antibodies make his blood favorable for newborn transfusions. When his hemoglobin and hematocrit were too low, his donations were refused. Many tests by several doctors did not lead to a solution. After a year and a half on a mostly ketogenic diet, however, his hemoglobin and hematocrit has stabilized at levels high enough to donate regularly again. He is satisfied. Next is a typical autoimmune profile. Low LDL, low tissue cholesterol, low triglycerides with a high catabolic score. If you see this pattern without an immune diagnosis, be on the lookout. It's around the corner. A low WBC indicates inflammatory fatty acid activity. Many clinicians and most people consider a low WBC an immune deficiency. A very low WBC score, minus 100, is immune deficiency. Hashimoto's WBC score is minus 52. We cannot measure inflammatory fatty acids in blood. They are in cells and tissues, and their half-life is seconds. Fortunately, Dr. Ravici outlined the effects of catabolic and anabolic lipids. 
As seen in the previous case, anabolic activity increases chloride loss and decreases serum chloride. Here, catabolic activity increases chloride retention. Therefore, high chloride here contributes to the catabolic activity score. Note, arrests in the lipid defense disrupt electrolytes. These disruptions reduce the charge on cell membranes, comprise cell function, and ultimately health. Another autoimmune diagnosis, Crohn's disease, with low total LDL and tissue cholesterol and low triglycerides. This young man's globulin score is 70, not unusual in autoimmunity. His anabolic activity is the result of a urinary tract infection. There is likely urine contamination from a complex fistula and lichenified granulomatous tissue around his anus. Lipids have relieved some symptoms, as do the numerous supplements his mother administers, along with homeopathics, rife frequencies, and hyperbaric treatments. But there is no substantial change in the course of his disease. CDR, the cell danger response, persists. My recommendation is helminthic therapy. Granulomas are traditionally associated with localized T helper type 1 cell inflammatory response around anitis. Helminthic therapy inhibits innate and increases humoral immunity. To date, the parents have been reluctant to give their son worms. A 62-year-old woman with osteoarthritis has a high total and LDL cholesterol. She is strongly anabolic, so catabolic lipid-bound sulfur is the treatment of choice. She has done very well on lipid-bound sulfur. We know Flamequel Plus is unlikely to be of help. She has neither of the two signs that indicate fatty acids are running rampant neither a high catabolic activity nor a, a low tissue cholesterol. Her high cholesterol is her body's defense against the inflammation of unbridled, free, non-esterified fatty acids. Anaerobic metabolism is unlikely here since her tissue cholesterol is within range. We saw this slide with the first two descriptions of pathology earlier. High inflammatory fatty acids without sufficient anti-fatty acids and high leukotrienes without sufficient anti-fatty acids. Now we add a third, high anti-fatty acids and still not sufficient. Our last case has all three pathologies, high fatty acids, a high catabolic activity score, high leukotrienes, high serum phospholipase A2, and anaerobic metabolism, high tissue cholesterol, high anabolic activity. The low WBC and high serum potassium from an intra to extracellular shift of potassium are hallmarks of catabolism. This case presents serious conundrums, not the least of which is his extraordinary abdominal girth that does not respond to elimination of carbohydrates and only temporarily to fasting. It appears he may have developed insulin resistance on prolonged ketogenic diets. And we have a chicken versus egg question. Is the significant elevation in his phospholipase A2 score of plus 100 a cause or an effect? 
We will discuss this case in more detail as the story unfolds. Presently, I am happy to say he has responded very favorably to an all stops out therapeutic lipid regimen. The four catabolic lipids and the fatty alcohols listed on our therapeutic lipids slide. He reports 40 to 50% increase now in his overall well being, including a calm and a vitality he has never known before, never in his 72 years. In recent queries, I learned he was exposed to the red tide toxin while surviving on the land, eating primarily mussels on a remote backpack trip when he was 20 years old. He had maple syrup urine two weeks later. Kidney troubles have been diagnosed and treated by Chinese doctors for more than a decade. Kidney disease is now appearing in his lab results. Possibly the red tide toxin is the culprit. Stay tuned. We will conclude by summarizing the lipid defense with an explanation of the CARAT trial, the beta carotene and retinal efficacy trial. Half of 18,000 subjects, all at risk for lung cancer, were given beta carotene and vitamin A. The other half served as controls. The study was terminated at 21 months, not only for lack of benefit from the supplements, the treated group had more lung cancer and more deaths from cardiovascular disease than the control. The treated half had higher cholesterol and triglycerides. Vitamin A is a fat soluble vitamin. It is a catabolic lipid. The rise in cholesterol and triglycerides is likely an anabolic defense, albeit inadequate, against an increase in catabolism. The subjects who succumbed to cardiovascular disease and lung cancer became too catabolic. Some might argue the toxicity of retinol palmitate, a synthetic vitamin A used, is the culprit. If true, a toxin can elicit the same excess in catabolism as a catabolic agent. Our ending note, a humble reminder. When we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. It is also a welcomed reminder. We are players in a magnificent universe.